We never know where life will lead us or what may hinder us along the way. But while every day can feel like one big question mark, it doesn't have to. With the right insights, strategies, and solutions from Western and Southern Financial Group, together we can look ahead to leave the unknown behind. early buzz you're out there in florida i heard it's hot as hell out there how's it going it is hot um the weather's actually perfect it's high 80s which is my sweet spot i i prefer hot to like middling hot if that makes sense like i i i I thrive when it's like you're sweating a little bit that's that's my go-to weather top five things you want to accomplish in florida uh golf is all one through five one through five? five maybe getting a tan mixed in there but that's about it aren't you planning a big disneyland trip with the fam oh no well, that's not something i want to get done it's i'm probably <laughs> gonna do it but it's not something i'm like looking too forward to i'm not a disney adult like my brother andy is Fair. he's big disney he's a he's like a disney adult i mean it's all you gotta say he's a disney adult is it, so i have like concerns with disney adults i don't want to get into them now that i know your brother is a disney adult but is that disney go ahead he knows is Disneyland in Florida or is it Disney World? How does that work? Disney World is in Florida. Disneyland is in California. Okay. And my only I don't experience, know, I don't know any much more from that. My only experience with Disneyland, I was a kid and my parents took us on one of the few vacations we went on as a kid. And it was an amusement park tour in California. We went to Universal Studios, Disneyland, Magic Mountain, which you've never been is freaking sick. And like a botanical garden, oh, yeah. some other things and stuff like that. But we went to Disneyland last and coming off of Magic Mountain, which might be like pound for pound or inch for inch, the best roller coaster theme park in the United States, Disneyland kind of sucked for me. Like I was not a fan of Disneyland because I was all in on the coasters and Magic Mountain is just coaster central. I'm like, there's no coaster at Disneyland that's gonna hold a candle to what Magic Mountain has. Yeah, if you're looking for roller coasters and like thrill rides, that is not Disney World. Which it, again- it is, a, it is an experiential park more so than a thrill seeking part the only other piece i have here on the catch and early buzz is i did talk to aiden hutchinson's dad for an hour and a half today a part of the hutchinson project and oh my gosh could not have come away more impressed with this dude man the guy that like won four big 10 championships never lost to ohio state at michigan broke their sacks record then just went to become a doctor after Michigan and has been a super uber supportive dad to Aiden Hutchinson. He's been to every single game. He's like, I've only ever missed one. And it was a lacrosse game that got rescheduled. Like this guy was uh, a rare human being. It was impressive to hear <laughs> that the stature of this guy um, and not surprising given how successful Aiden has been. That's the only other piece of the catch and early buzz. On to mock draft season. Dale Jeremiah of NFL Network or NFL Media has had had a new mock draft come out, I think yesterday. We're recording this Wednesday, February 23rd. He had this mock draft come out uh, on February 22nd. The initial takeaway I had, and there's a handful here, but can we please, can we please talk about the Kayvon Thibodeau stuff? I know we talked about it a little bit on Monday mm-hmm. and, and how... You know, Tom McShay talks to some people at the Senior Bowl. You know, ESPN's Tom McShay talks to some people at the Senior Bowl and finds out that there are NFL teams that don't view him as this top five prospect, right? And then from there, we have Daniel Jeremiah dropping him all the way down to eight in his latest mock draft. I was talking to Bucky Brooks last night for the Hutchinson Project, and he's like, he's a boomer brust player. There's a lot of this conversation, you know, in, in Daniel Jeremiah's write-up for Kayvon Thibodeau going eight, he says he could go as high as one overall, two overall, all the way outside of the top 10. Like the, what that tells me, a combination of those things, right? Hearing Bucky Brooks say he's a boomer bust player. Tom McShay has talked to multiple people in the NFL that don't see him as a top five pick. Daniel Jeremiah dropping him eight with the Falcons is that there are some teams that love this guy and there are some teams that don't like this guy. Don't like this guy to a point where like he's not even on the top of their draft board, let alone, you know, a top five player in this class. And it's not just eighth overall. Like they have... Trayvon Walker, another edge defender. And now he's a little different type of player and differently sized. But they have Trayvon Walker going five, or DJ does. So jumping 
Kayvon Thibodeau in this draft. I, I'm not surprised, I'll say. I, I mean, Kayvon Thibodeau, hell of an athlete, but still is a project. And when you guy, have a guy who's a project, you're going to have different teams see him differently and different teams feel differently about his likelihood of hitting that upside, you know, hitting that sort of ceiling that you're buying into by drafting him that highly. Um, probably very similar to like when Deion Jordan was coming out. There were probably teams that would not have even thought to draft him as highly as he went that year. Was he number two overall? Like that, that where the Dolphins ended up taking him. Like no, there were probably teams that probably had him outside of the top 10, but all it takes is one. So TBD on where he does fall, but it is interesting that pretty universally getting panned at the moment um, by pretty much every market. I just find it so difficult to speak to this fall, right, and speak to this boomer bust mentality that others have on Kayvon Thibodeau without actually having talked to him or talked to these teams that have talked to his coaches or wherever they're getting this information because none of the feedback or none of the analysis you're getting with Kayvon Thibodeau is that he's not a good football player, right? A lot of it is like he was fantastic at Oregon. Talking to Bucky Brooks last night, he mentioned that there are times where you can tell he's not – got the gas pedal through the floor because I asked him to compare Aiden Hutchinson, Aiden Hutchinson to Kayvon Thibodeau and Hutchinson does not let up, right? This is a guy that is that fits the cliche of high effort, high motor, white guy off the edge, right? He is nonstop, relentless every game, you know, seven days a week. And with Kayvon Thibodeau, he mentioned that, and I think this is consistent analysis with other draft analysts as well, is that Kayvon Thibodeau isn't that, right? Kayvon Thibodeau isn't pedal to the metal nonstop on the football field or maybe even off the football field as well. Again, difficult to speak to without talking to him. I always find that difficult because all I have to get gauge off of it is obviously the interviews that we've seen, you know, some of the conversations we've had with guys like DJ and Bucky, and then the tape. And the tape screams, holy shit, this guy could be good. But I think you hit the nail on the head there, Mike, in that teams are questioning, can he be that good in the NFL? And can he be that good consistently, hit his upside consistently, with the concerns or the perceived concerns about him, you know, pushing the gas pedal through the floor and, and being that consistent player on and off the field, man. I think you say this like two months ago that Kayvon Thibodeau is falling outside the top two, even top three, even people would call you an idiot. Now, I think you're going to more consistently see him not be, you know, a lock to go number one to the Jags or hell, even inside the top five, which I think is concerning, man. It's concerning when all of the same people are having the same reactions. Going back to the Daniel Jeremiah mock draft, he had Evan Neal going number one overall, Aiden Hutchinson going number two to the Detroit Lions, in which after the limited research I've done, I feel that is his floor. He will not get past. I'll say it right now. Put me on old takes exposed. Aiden Hutchinson will not get past the number two overall pick with the Detroit Lions. It just won't happen. It will not happen, barring an injury at the combine or whatever it may be, knock on wood. Houston Texans then grabbed Kyle Hamilton, the safety at Notre Dame, arguably the top player in this class. Iki Aquanu, the first offensive tackle off the board. Can we pause there? That I'm seeing. That's not it Evan Neal went number one. Oh, sorry. Second tackle off the board. Never mind. Iki Aquanu going number four overall to the yeah. Jets. I think more people consistently seeing them go offensive tackle. Giants then grab Trayvon Walker. I know you had that as a takeaway. I think that's the highest I've seen the edge defender out of Georgia going, Trayvon Walker. He writes here a unique talent because of his size, athleticism, and versatility. I think I've seen comparisons to Rashawn Gary with, with, with Trayvon Walker, which if he shows up Rashawn Gary levels at the combine, yeah, he's going to be a top five pick because those that that that, that – athleticism that size combination just doesn't fall far in the draft yeah we are doing the offense combine preview today and we're going to say you know who has the most gain at each position flat out Trayvon Walker has the most gain with combine at edge we're, we're not doing defense right now but I'll just give you a little preview he has the most gain because like you said if he tests like Rashawn Gary he's going to go in the range at least that Rashawn Gary went which I believe he was 13th overall back in 2019 so to Javon Walker, if you test like that, that's going to be about his floor at that point. How stunned were you to also see at six overall for the Carolina Panthers, not Charles Cross, Trevor Penning of Northern Iowa? And I think every time I see Dale and Jeremiah come out with mock drafts in this stage of the pre-draft process, so much of it is what he's hearing from NFL teams. And that rightfully so, right? I'm not discrediting in his own analysis. It's not, it's not that he hasn't watched these guys or whatever. It's more that like, oh my gosh, I'm hearing more and more that the league is high on a guy like Trevor Penning going ahead of Charles Cross, who yeah. he has falling all the way to 22 with the Las Vegas Raiders, who a lot of people in this industry feel that he's the top offensive tackle in this draft. And a lot of people in this industry feel like he's a lock for the top 10. Your reaction to Trevor Penning going at six? 
Yeah, DJ just sees the tackles vastly different, at least cross versus penning. Might have been vastly different because to have cross all the way at 22 and penning that high, I, I mean, 16 picks between them is basically saying one ma- massive difference in valuation. So penning to the Panthers, uh, I mean, the need is there, but like penning is still a project. You know, coming on Northern Iowa, mauled people at the senior bowl, but was not particularly good in pass protection, which is, you know, kind of what the Carolina Panthers need. So that to me, not a fit that I'd love if I'm a Panthers fan to, you know, fix that line quickly. I can't imagine Daniel Jeremiah got a lot of good quality mentions on Twitter from Giants fans because he had them going Trayvon Walker, who that's the highest anyone's seen Trayvon Walker go. And then at seven, grabbing a receiver in Drake London. Every mock draft I've written or you guys have written and seeing the comments, if you don't give them an offensive lineman, they, they want blood. Giants fans want an offensive lineman in this class and to see Charles Cross available, right? Or even, you know, if Trevor Penning is viewed that highly, Trevor Penning available and them not going after him, I think that would be a surprise by Giants fan. They had him, like, like I said, Drake London, the USC wide receiver, going at seven. Then Kayvon Thibodeau at, at eight, the Atlanta Falcons, which I think, I mean, I, I, I got to hear more about this Kayvon Thibodeau guy. I got to hear more about why he's sliding. But, man, I would feel that's a dream scenario for the Atlanta Falcons to get a talent like Kayvon Thibodeau at eight. Then at nine, one. Oh, my, I, go ahead. my uh, inside info, my ex-girlfriend, she said she didn't even meet him there. She was just at his party. He was, she was, wait, didn't okay, wait, let's expand here. She was at his party but did not see him there. Didn't even, didn't meet him. Who nope. did she meet? Did you, did you pry any further? Who else was there? No, I didn't really care much. Come on. You, you, this is the first time you're going to actually provide some access quality to this podcast. It's me. Who's interviewing. She didn't guys. Meet Kevin Wait, was it, were there other players the there? I, I, I'm, I'm disappointed. I'm disappointed. Your ex. I'm, just, I'm disappointed. Your ex. I'm calling her out. Let's get her on the pod. Let's get her on the pod. Uh, nine she overall. Kevin Thibodeau was. <laughs> So right after Kayvon Thibodeau at eight, this is another stunner. One pick behind Kayvon Thibodeau, Jermaine Johnson, who had an absolutely stellar senior bowl. That's obvious. So stellar that he didn't even play the rest of the week after the first two days of practice. Going nine overall to the Denver Broncos. That is another player. I think that's the highest I've seen him go in any mock draft this season. Yeah, that one's wild to me. And we'll highlight him as someone who could struggle at the combine. I'd be surprised if he tests. I mean, he's not going to test like a Trayvon Walker is going to test. I, I am excited to see what his numbers are because he is one of the most pro-ready sort of edges, but I just have questions about what caliber of athlete he is. So to go nine overall would mean he's a pretty high caliber athlete by you know, NFL standards. If They don't usually draft average athletes top 10. Sauce Gardner, the Cincinnati cornerback, goes 10 to the New York Jets. Um, I think a lot of people have them taking the top cornerback available, whether that's at 4 or 10, so no surprises really there. But then at 11, Washington Commanders, essentially replacing Brandon Scherf, assuming that he lose, they lose him in free agency, grabbing Kenyon Green, another situation where we see that's the highest I've seen Kenyon Green go. Yeah, I love Kenyon Green, so I can get on board with this, but – if you're the commanders and you go, and now I think Kenny Green can play tackle, but they don't necessarily need to tackle Washington anymore after signing, uh, what's his face, left tackle from the Bears long term, uh, whose now name is now, excuse me, uh, which boy state. I'm so bad with names, but whatever. Um, but going linebacker and then guard back to back years, you're talking about positional value and what, like, kind of not to do to build a franchise. I would be a little sad if I'm the Washington commanders, and that's my first, my first rounders the last two years that would be a classic classic example of drafting for need assuming they lose scherf and not drafting for value and i know that's something that you've said a ton yeah. in other podcasts where in the in the in free agency you sign for need in the draft you draft for value and that's including positional value and guard low on that chart at 12 trent mcduffie to the minnesota vikings that is a fit that i do really like i think i had that in my latest mock draft cleveland browns they don't go wide receiver one of the few times i've seen not a non-wide receiver mock to them but one of my favorite players in this draft george carloff just goes to the cleveland browns and you know the rest is a little bit chalky but at 14 the baltimore ravens Derek stingley jr could he fall that far? I know we're doing the defensive combine preview uh, on a future episode. I think the Monday episode. I had him as a guy that could has the most to gain from the combine, right? If he shows up to the combine and answers medical checks and, and tests as well as people think, I think he could vault himself up back to cornerback one status and upside of the top 10. But could you see him falling all the way down to 14? I could. I definitely could. 
because of the way sort of the valuation of cornerback and how teams are willing to pass on it towards the top of the draft a lot of times and think they can find that position later on drafts. And because of how scheme specific it often is, but man, that, that would just be, like I said, it's not that strong of a class at the top, like chase some guys that have real deal potential at that point. I mean, you can hit, I just think that he has true number one type of potential that not a lot of other corners have in his class. So that to me is wild, a little wild. I'll argue this. If I'm a front office, if I'm not an entire front office, if I'm working in a front office and I'm making decisions, if at any point someone suggests that we take Kenyon Green, who is a phenomenal player, a guy that you're in love with, a guard though, <laughs> yeah. over Derek Stingley. I don't care how many cornerbacks we have on our team. We're taking Derek Stingley. Like that's just a fact. Like yeah. to throw how good the player is out the window. That's the value of Derek Stingley and what he could be is so much, even if Kenyon Green becomes a day one starter, like that's how valuable Derek Stingley could be at the next yes. level. At 15, David Ajabo to the Philadelphia Eagles. I think that's a mock, a mock pick we're seeing consistently. I had Ajabo going to the Eagles at 15. At 16, they grabbed Devontae Wyatt, who is the first defensive tackle off the board ahead of Jordan Davis. I think you're going to see more draft analysts, Daniel Jeremiah included, having Devontae Wyatt as the first defensive tackle off the board. And honestly, probably the first defensive tackle on big boards when it's all said and done. I think I had, I think the comp for Wyatt and draft guys, honestly, Javon Hargrave, I think. May not be. Don't quote me on that. But I think it might be, which pairing those two together is – They'd be a nice guy to learn from if you're if you're Devontae Wyatt. Los Angeles Chargers grab a receiver. They don't grab Jamison Williams. It's Chris Olave, and he has, and I want to have, spend some time here, Chris Olave going at 17, the Los Angeles Chargers. Kenny Pickett, a quarterback, going to the, the Saints at 18. I think just pick your flavor, right? I think the Saints are going to be mocked a quarterback at 18 until told otherwise. Everyone has the Saints taking a quarterback at that spot. And then at 19, Philadelphia Eagles grabbing Garrett Wilson. I am starting to see more and more from some analysts, some pundits on Twitter, this Chris Olave over Garrett Wilson takes so much that there's enough smoke. I want to go back and watch the tape. I want to go back and 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 you know reevaluate Chris Olave and reevaluate Garrett Wilson because I went into this draft and really went into this offseason feeling that Garrett Wilson was healthily ahead of Chris Olave as a receiver prospect. I feel both those players as first rounders, but it's gotten to the point now where you're seeing this consistently enough where I want to go back and watch the tape. Watch it. I, I, to me, it's like pick your flavor. I think Lil Lave is safer. Wilson's provides a higher end. And then at that point, which one do you value more? I'm going to go for the higher end because I think Garrett Wilson could be that guy in your offense, like a true number one, whereas Lave is a pretty safe number two. But you're the Chargers, you have a Keenan Allen. You don't need another Keenan Allen, which would be like Garrett Wilson is what he could bring to the table. You need the reliable guy on the outside that can get open deep. That's Chris Olave. So I think it's going to be, again, like I said, pick your flavor depending on what situation you have. I do think that with most positions, right, there is more – the flavor conversation is not brought up enough, especially among fans, right? It's like, we need a cornerback, just take the just best. Better. Yeah, yeah, just take the best cornerback yeah. there. We need a receiver, just take the best receiver available. Oftentimes, if not most of the time, when you are selecting a player, especially outside like the top five, outside the top 10, you're looking for a player that fits your offense or fits your defense best the flavor that fits into your offense. I think I was talking to Danny Kelly from The Ringer. He's a draft analyst for them at the Combine. Or no, we haven't been in the Combine yet. At the Super Bowl. And he was his word that he used consistently was vibes. He's like, it just depends on the vibe. The vibe that you're chasing at receiver. If you want this vibe or this vibe. And I think that's more of a, a, a millennial or a Zoomer. I don't even know what generation no, that's that is. No, that's not a millennial. Is it Zoomer? That's a... Gen Z. Gen Z. Gen Z. I think that's more of a Gen Z word, but I can get behind it. Speaking of vibes, how good would the vibes be if the Pittsburgh Steelers can stay put at 20 and still get Malik Willis? That would be a dream scenario for Malik, for, for Mike Tomlin, knowing how much the Steelers organization is interested in getting a quarterback and also uh, specifically interested in Malik Willis. Yeah, they, they that ain't happening in my opinion. I, I would be floored if the Pittsburgh Steelers are one staying put with Malik Willis falling there and then to Malik Willis even falling there in the first place. The volatility in these mocks this off season, I think are going to be, it's going to just be spectacular. Uh, yeah. Something like Great we've never content. seen before. Chad, Chad Ryder, another NFL media 
Ryder, his last name's Ryder as well, had the Carolina Panthers trading up from six to three with the Houston Texans to grab Malik Willis. And in a very the same mm-hmm. the same site, um, you know, obviously a different analyst than Daniel Jeremiah has Malik Willis falling to twenty. And I know Daniel Jeremiah is adamant about not mocking trades early in the pre draft process, but still it does speak to the volatility that we're gonna see um, in these mock drafts. At twenty uh, or twenty one, Devin Lloyd going to the New England Patriots. I think that's the first time I've seen that fit i've often seen receiver with the new england patriots but still i do feel like this range he has devin lloyd the linebacker from utah going at 21 to the new england patriots and then nicobe dean going at 24 to the dallas cowboys if these linebackers are coming off the board in the first round i do feel the 20 to 32 range is where i start to feel most comfortable right i don't i haven't like loved a lot of the mock drafts that have Lloyd or Dean going inside the top 15, right? Like, I just do think that's too rich considering position of value and also just considering both those players. I like them top 15. I, I think they're that good as linebacker prospects, but I can see, I mean, erring on the side of conservatism at the position with how, how poorly a lot of the dudes have transitioned at the linebacker position from college to the NFL. It's not a position where a lot of guys have really made an immediate impact. Micah Parsons aside, but Micah Parsons made his impact basically as like a pass rusher. Like that was, that's where Micah Parsons' impact was felt. And so that's like an easily, tra- not say easily translatable skill, but that's that's not why you're drafting Lloyd or Dean. So I don't hate the conservative approach there, but I do think these guys are, I don't want to say linebacker prospects we've never seen before, but they're up there with some of the best um, that we have seen at the position. Talk about dream scenario for the Pittsburgh Steelers, Malik Willis, if Charles Cross falls to 22 for the Las Vegas Raiders, that would be a yeah. dream scenario for them. It allows them to kick Alex Leatherwood full-time inside the guard. You don't have to continue to think about that transition or, or get him back on board with playing right tackle. And you, you get a really good player, man. I think Charles Cross falling outside the top 20 would be wild to see. Now, I will say, and we'll get to the combine preview soon, he's not going to test like Evan Neal. You know, he's not going to test like Iki Aquanu. Like, these guys are going to be really explosive, and you're going to see that in their jumps and those things. But still a really you know, really good player. I think that's a, a good thing for them. But before you touch on Cross, the other pick here, Kyler Gordon, your guy, the other Washington corner, going at 23 to the Arizona Cardinals. That's the highest I think I've seen him go as well. Yeah, I like Gordon. Uh, 23 might be a touch high, but, like, athletes at the corner like him aren't going to last long. He's going to be a guy who – we're going to highlight top performers at every position. That's that's your corner top performer, unless Derek Stingley's back fully healthy. But Kylie Gordon's going to blow it up. Do the Dallas Cowboys at 24, if N'Kobe Dean is available, go get N'Kobe Dean. After all the investment they spent at linebacker, Micah Parsons, Jabril Cox, they signed um, Keanu Neal, who Mike McCarthy called the best off-ball linebacker available yeah. in last year's free agency. Like they have, I mean, obviously Leighton Van Der Esch is expected to walk via free agency this offseason, so you're replacing a linebacker in that room, but I might... I feel like they have an embarrassment of riches there. Do they just because Nicobe Dean is this rare talent continue to add to that linebacker room? I do love the fit or just in terms of Dean and Parsons, it's going to be a headache for opposing offenses like that, that in and of itself, just the idea of it is so enticing, but man, the way this mock kind of played out and we're thinking about like the decision the Cowboys would have here with the board, the next four, three picks are going to be Traylon Burks and Arkansas wide receiver that, they may need wide receivers should they deal Amari Cooper or should they let Michael Gallup walk. Tyler Linderbaum, center, the Tennessee Titans. Jamison Williams, wide receiver coming off the board. And also, you have Bernard Ryman on the board as well. Like, that would be a decision that the Cowboys have some more valuable positions looking them in the face. Pretty good prospects, but I might lean Dean myself there. That's just wow. too... Hashtag fun to watch. Two hashtag fun to watch. He has Traylon Brooks, the Arkansas receiver, going to the Buffalo Bills at 25. Linderbaum to the Titans at 26. I haven't had in any mock draft I've written Tyler Linderbaum fall past the Arizona Cardinals at 23, but I do love the Tennessee Titans picking Linderbaum up at 26. I love that value. I love that player. Jameson Williams to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. I think a lot of people will be mocking them a wide receiver, assuming that Chris Godwin walks via free agency, and obviously Antonio Brown's not walking through that door. And how about this pick for your Green Bay Packers? I really like this, especially if they're in this run-it-back mode um, with Aaron Rodgers back and Devontae Adams back, but they have to move on from some of their edge talent, specifically Zedarius Smith. They bring in Boye Mafe of Minnesota, a guy that I know Daniel Jeremiah was really impressed with coming out of the Senior Bowl. Yeah, the Packers love athletes along the defensive line. You know, whether it's Rashawn Gary, 
whether it's Nick Perry, whether it's Kenny Clark, they love guys who blow up the combine basically on the defensive line. That's a lot of guys they draft early in the draft. Boy, Mafe figures to be one of those. And again, they're probably going to lose Preston and Darius Smith this offseason. So the wide receiver class is kind of cooked like it has been in this mock draft. I wouldn't hate it. Wouldn't hate it. And and I and I will say, DJ at the, at the Super Bowl, I was talking to him, talk, just touched about the quarterback class. And then he just asked me, like, you know, anyone impressed you at the Senior Bowl? And I was like, you know, uh, I think I said Trevor Penning was, like, fun. Like, he had an interesting week. And he's like, dude, boy, I'm off a first rounder. And I'm like, hey, let's go. And I was like, brief conversation, but he's all in on boy, I'm off a. Next pick he has Tyler Smith, the redshirt sophomore offensive lineman at Tulsa going at 29 to the Miami Dolphins. I will say this, seeing Daniel Jeremiah put him in his first round, also knowing that you're a big fan of Tyler Smith's tape, I think the smoke and fire is real. The buzz is real. Kid is six foot six, three thirty, and entered the draft coming out of Tulsa as a redshirt sophomore with a COVID abbreviated yeah. 2020 season. That, in my opinion, tells you what. When he went to the committee that gives draft grades out to players that are considering declaring for the draft, buddy, those guys told him some good ass news, and he made the decision to leave Tulsa as an underclassman, redshirt sophomore, and enter the draft, I do think he will get first-round buzz, and this might be a guy that goes to the combine and, and has some success to a point where he does get inside the top 50 uh, of the NFL draft. Yeah, the suit's tape is wild as a run blocker, just anywhere. He has some insane core strength to him to just throw guys. Um, pass protection is a complete nightmare, but he is – a bully straight up. He had, I think, five more big time blocks than any other off line in the country last year. He was just pancaking guys left and right on tape. And now, obviously, the level of competition is different than, you know, what Evan Neal, even Nicky Aquano is going up against. But for redshirt sophomore, be as powerful as he is, you just, again, you don't find that in the fourth round. Those guys go highly, no matter because it is a rare tool set or a rare physical attribute that can translate to a football field. So, Tyler Smith, first round, not quite on board with that, but he's a real deal tackle prospect. Are the Miami Dolphins crazy to buy into another first round off to tackle prospect? That's what you said in pass at, protection? Yes. Well, at, shit, I mean, anyone at this point, pick 29, the chance of you getting a guy to really impact right away, for agency has got to be the move. I, I, although I will say Bernard Ryman's kind of like, he's comes off the board here at 31, which would be a dream scenario for the Bengals, but uh, just 29 is not where you find immediate impact. Like you're going to have another project on your hands, another guy to wait three years to develop that the Dolphins don't have that kind of time. I mean, they're my, so the, I, I would, I would lean elsewhere if I was them at this the, point. The Dolphins are my favorite landing spot for Toronto Armstead. I think it's highly unlikely that New Orleans Saints re-signed yeah. him back with the cap situation that they're in. And the Miami Dolphins don't need a Tyler Smith as good as he could be in three years. They need a Toronto Armstead that's good today. That could be good tomorrow. And I think, yeah. um, you know, they have the cap space to do it as well. We've talked about that on previous podcasts. Last few picks here, and then we'll get to the offensive combine preview. Kansas City Chiefs grab Jackson Hill, uh, the safety prospect coming out of Michigan, 31. Same pick I had for the Bengals, Bernard Ryman of Central Michigan going to them. Like you said, a dream scenario, a guy that could come in and play right tackle immediately for them. And at 32, big boy, Jordan Davis comes off the board with the Detroit Lions. I found this pick hilarious because they've already invested so much on the interior defensive line with Lee McNeil. Uh, of NC State. They obviously grabbed Levi and Wuzurike of Washington in the previous draft. They had Jordan Davis that mix. Are they just going to build of just a just a bunch of bullies down low? Like a bunch of three... They just have a bunch of nose tackles down low? I, I, I'd i be surprised if they did grab another guy that could play on the interior uh, along the defensive line with such a high pick. Yeah, that would be... That would be something. I'll say that. <laughs> like, I mean, at that Ultra point, changer. at that point, you're just kind of like punting on developing Lee McNeil because the exact position Jordan Davis is going to play is Lee McNeil's. Like, Lee McNeil needs to play on yeah. the nose, in my opinion, in the NFL. He's that 330 pounder for them. And Levi Woods Rike is more, you know, can play more three tech, doesn't have to be on the center. But Jordan Davis, like, you're not, you bring him in, you're essentially making a Lee McNeil backup who they obviously invested. Stopping the run, though. You're stopping the run. Definitely I mean, that's, the run. that's a fact. Dave Gettleman's waxing it, poetic about this pick. He's like, oh my God, just keep adding defensive tackles. I love it. You got Aiden Hutchinson, Ali McNeil, Levi Muzurike, the Aquaras, Jordan Davis. They're just saying, run on us. Dare you. Dare you to run on us. That's hilarious. I'll say this. So, DJ's, 
This is a DJ is a mock draft influencer. He 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 knows that his mock drafts will influence others and influence where people see you guys in the class. That's he he has reached that level of influence. So I think some of these picks towards the end of the first round, and I'm guilty of it myself, are guys he wanted to kind of shoehorn in there. Like Traylon Burks to the Bills doesn't really make sense. Like from a fit, what they would need. I don't think the Bills are going out. Like Tyler Smith. I think he just wanted to prove a point that, hey, Tyler Smith yeah. is a damn good player, 29 to the Dolphins. And then 32, Jordan Davis was kind of like, a, oh, shit, I forgot Jordan Davis up to this point. He needs to be in the first round. Those were the, That kind of seemed like to me at that and point. And I'd love to have that conversation with Daniel Jeremiah and other, like, you know, mock draft influencers because, to use your thing. Go ahead. Like myself. <laughs> Is that what you were going to say? No, that wasn't what I was going to say. What I was oh, going okay. to say uh, is... Uh, my bad, I cut you off there. But yeah, I, I will say that it's a thing. Like, you get towards the end, you're like, oh, fit and whatever. You just want to get some guys in the first round. And because I was on shit, I was on the Bengals podcast, the Lockdown Bengals, and you're just like, that guy might be there. That guy might not be there. It's so difficult at that point to project where a class can fall that... Are you really projecting hardcore needs at that point, especially when a lot of those teams down there don't have a ton of needs? No, I don't think so. I also feel that not enough conversation is made around mock drafts as a content vessel and less like a pure fact forecasting vessel, right? Like we had Lance Zierlein on our SiriusXM show, which we're doing again this year. Catch it on Fridays every single week on SiriusXM NFL Radio Channel 88. We had Lance Zierlein on. We were talking about a mock draft with him. He's like, you know, what I do with mock drafts is just like, give people different scenarios that could happen, right? Like show people like that. Yeah. Th these players could go in the first round. Like that's what the exercise is. When, when Dale Jeremiah and others are writing a mock draft in February before the combine, they're really just leveraging what is a super searched term in mock draft, an uber search term to just get some of their opinion out there, get some of their opinion on the class out there. Cause right now I'll tell you what, if Dale Jeremiah yeah. wrote that same article and it said 32 players I like that could, you know, be top picks in the draft, no one would have found it and no one would have read it. Mm -hmm. Everyone reads 2022 NFL mock draft and everyone's excited to see the fit and everyone's excited to see that and, and believes it is gold and, and sees it as this forecast when it's really just an exercise and, and a content vessel to talk about these players and all that stuff because so many people like mock drafts. All right, off of my content spiel, we, we talked to the University of Cincinnati today. We, did, uh, we went, to, went there and talked with the class. I think, Mike, I, I, I overstepped my bounds there and, and talked too much as I always do. Yeah, you were. That's your element. It's my you element. Went in being like, I'm. These kids are going to remember me five years from now. So I, for what I say, I'll say this. Yeah, that was your entire goal. You, you wanted to go in there. You want. You wanted those kids to like cite you. No, on their like no. obituaries that they changed can, your life. Can I respond <laughs> to that? Can I respond to that? One, one coming out of the conversation we had with these students at the University of Cincinnati who are working in media production and, and want internships and all that stuff and are asking for advice on how to get into this industry. One, I can 100% see how you'd have that takeaway from how I said it. Two, I hope, I hope you understand and they understand that it just comes from like a really genuine place because I, my yeah, road, I my road Rats, to this, yeah. my road to this job is unique and I feel like a viable story for how people get here. And I think when I am in this position to talk to, I've had these conversations with the University of Cincinnati, with the University of Colorado, San Diego State, talk to them at Michigan. Like when I have these opportunities to answer those types of questions, it's like, guess what? You're getting a very genuine me because I have a real big passion for this and I feel like I have a good understanding. Anyway. but And you also took a route that is traditional in nature yeah. to the position mm -hmm. and that journalism internships in the media field that sort of thing or i did not yeah so that's going to be like my advice i, I go in there and i'm like don't fucking get an accounting degree yeah so that's my, i think that was the biggest <laughs> takeaway like i had too you know <laughs> don't get an accounting degree was the biggest takeaway i also had uh remember that this podcast is presented by the presenting sponsor is all 22 our friends at all 22 are unveiling the newest fantasy football game that hundreds of pff employees have been playing all 22 uses pff grades as one of its main scoring components and tests your ability to build a 53 man roster offensive line included now i've been on this podcast i've read this read multiple times but i want to continue to go into detail on like how cool this could be when you get into it and when you start to play it's it's not you are not. You are going to go from playing fantasy football with your mom and your dad and your friends or whoever it may be, and all you're doing is predicting stats. You are not predicting player performance. You are predicting 
touchdowns. It's why like valuable stats in fantasy football are like red zone targets, red zone opportunities, routes run, touch opportunities, all this stuff, and not so much like how good is he? Like how good is this player is very rarely brought up in traditional fantasy and never brought up for non-skill player positions, offensive line, defensive line, linebacker, etc. With all 22 and leveraging PFF grades as its main scoring component, you can draft a player that maybe doesn't have 50 red zone targets but is a really effective receiver a really effective tight end that grades really well for you or blocks really well and all that stuff so i think it's a cool it's a cool game to play if you're not into predicting fancy points which fancy points are just touchdowns yards and all that stuff this is predicting pancake blocks sacks pressures uh, tackles for loss, beating blocks, even if you don't get a tackle for loss, like PFF grades holds into account. Uh, if you ever, if you have ever dreamt of sitting on, in an NFL front office, if you enjoy the scouting process, you are going to want to check out All22. Join the waitlist on dash all-22.com with nothing more than your email. If you join the waitlist before the NFL draft, you'll receive a special promo code with your All22 subscription. Waitlist users will gain an access to premium content like the inaugural draft guides and season strategies, feature release announcements, and more. Be sure to follow All22 on Twitter. My favorite tagline in the industry right now, All22, less fantasy, more football. One more comment on that. It's like Aaron Rodgers throws an absolute pearl for a 20-yard, no, let's say a 30-yard touchdown, left sideline, Devontae Adams, something that gets graded really well in PFF system is scored the same way in fantasy football if he does a dump off screen to Aaron Jones. That's the difference, right? Like you are getting into this game to, you know, actually predict you know, the cool shit in football and less so much like the the literal box score. So that's my la- that's yes. my rant on all twenty two. Uh on to offensive combine preview. What we did here, what you did here, and I'll have some reactions to it, is the most to gain, top performer, guy who might struggle and others who could help themselves for every single offensive position heading into the combine. Before we get into that, before we preview the offensive players and the defensive players we'll do on the Monday podcast, how valuable is the combine to you in your draft evaluation process? And I guess what percentage would you say measurables and the information that you gain? Let's go beyond measurables. The information you gain from going to and factoring in the combine into your process. I hate that question just in terms of like, oh, how valuable is it? Some guys, it doesn't matter at all. Like Carson Strong is going to go to the combine. I can give an absolute shit what he does at the combine. If he runs a 5'9", 40 versus a 5'4", 40 or 5'1", 40, none of that matters because I'm not drafting for that. Um, other positions, though, it may be more valuable or like a center. Center is not super valuable. Edge rusher is pretty valuable. But – and then again, it's case-by-case basis of – you know, I, I know, uh, like, if you know a guy like a, I don't know, you, you know a guy like Drake London, and now he's hurt and he's not going to test. But Drake London, you know he's slow. He runs a four six three whatever. You know he's slow. That's not a big deal. Like, it's not, like, I'm trying to think how to best word this. Like, it is a case-by-case basis based off of your preconceived notions of a guy. If you are worried about a guy's athleticism and he exceeds it, that's a good thing. If you think you guys are an elite athlete, like a Tutu Atwell last year, I think Tutu Atwell was an elite athlete, and he tests like a middling to below average athlete considering his size, and you're like, oh, shit. So that to me is you, if you don't come into the combine with expectations on a guy, yeah. that, that's the biggest thing. That's, that's doing it wrong in my opinion. Like you should go in with a thought of who a guy is and then use it as almost a check or something to – change your opinion should you be wrong on a guy and what he is as an athlete. I think Bucky Brooks had a really good tweet on the influence or the importance of the combine when he said, you know, this is an opportunity to like officially put numbers out uh, for your measurables and your athletic testing to confirm what you've seen already on tape and to make slight adjustments in your draft board if things come against or you know show yes. up against your expectation. You know, he, he speaks to like media has created this – enhanced volatility in your draft board whereas nfl teams if you go into the combine and a guy goes up or down 50 spots you did something wrong it's not like oh wow the combine helped him so much i can't believe it the combine so important to his success it's not like you screwed up you didn't see that athleticism on tape and he showed up and surprised you you failed when you were looking on tape and didn't see that stuff like 50 60 70 spot movers uh coming after the combine is just absurd like this is an opportunity to 
split hairs on guys and move guys in this like 10 to 15 range more likely or like just ahead of another at his position or just below another at his position if they don't meet certain thresholds or they test maybe slightly below or slightly above your expectations based on what you saw on film I think the other thing I was trying to hint at this when I asked you but like the other part of this too is the same shit Tom McShay did at the Senior Bowl talking to NFL teams talking to other evaluators and seeing where they are at the class interviewing this players for hours on end seeing how they react to that the medical checks you bring up Carson Strong I don't care what he runs but if this knee is as bad as people are saying it is he's gonna fall off boards like he'll come out of the combine multiple you know multiple rounds down if this knee is as bad as maybe some of the rumors have been so I do think that there's a lot of this combine that can influence an opinion on a player um that goes beyond just his athletic testing too which again mm-hmm. if you go into the combine and you know your entire draft board is reshaped by the combine you probably didn't enter with enough firm expectations based on tape or something massive came up right like a heart red flag with Maurice Hurst that we saw a few years ago or this knee injury comes back bad or he just completely bombs the interview process who is that Florida edge player that just like just completely bom- polite. yeah Ja'Kai Polite was- show up Makai, Ja'Kai Blight was mocked as his first rounder that falls like to day two, day three, because he bombs the interview process. So there's those outliers that are significantly affected from the combine, but a bulk majority of these guys, there's just so much less volatility than maybe the media can project. And we'll have articles on PFF.com that say risers and fallers from the combine because it's great content and people love to see that, but they won't be like significant, significant movers, maybe like other draft boards. Let's get to quarterback. Most to gain, top performer, guy who might struggle, others who could help themselves. Yeah, this one quarterback you don't go to the combine looking to alter your draft for it much if at all honestly you really shouldn't but most of the game and the top performer in my opinion will be Malik Willis because if he tests like a you know elite athlete not even just for the quarterback position for like a running back if he goes you know low four fives and puts together you know high tens in the broad jump highest thirties in the vertical jump tests like that you can really buy into him being like a tier one type of rushing threat. And I was actually talking with this about Brady Quinn the other day about like, he doesn't, he thinks Malik Willis is closer to like a Jalen Hurts as a runner, which is good, like still a weapon, but that's not really a guy that you can completely base a rushing offensive off of and and really have it impact opposing defenses and worry that he is going to go off at any given moment. So that's why I think Malik Willis obviously is the most athletic of this bunch. But he also has the most to gain by really proving that, hey, I'm a NFL caliber running back as well as quarterback. We already know how big he is. He went to the Senior Bowl and weighed in at six foot two twenty. I expect he's going to be in a similar range at the combine, right? I think weight can fluctuate depending on how they approach the combine, but height won't do won't be too much different. And you know, the reports are from Bruce Feldman's freaks list where he ended up at thirty. Is he ran who has clocked a four five flat forty yard dash and a thirty eight and a half inch vertical? Those numbers show up at the combine. Like you said, low four fives, high thirties in the vertical. It's just going to do that much, you know, that much more to confirm that he can be like this, like legit, yeah. like like you said, tier one rushing threat at the next level. Another another quarterback I want to bring up. I know you have Malik Willis as the most to gain and the top performer, but Desmond Ritter. Desmond Ritter was another guy that showed up on Bruce Feldman's freaks list at fifty six. Um, he, you know, supposedly has clocked a four five five forty yard dash broad jump at ten eight inches, a four flat short shuttle. And a 36-inch vert, which is not in the tier of Malik Willis. He also doesn't weigh nearly as much as Malik Willis. But man, that would be if he runs 4.55 and and has some of these numbers that you know Bruce Feldman is reporting from the Athletic. That is going to be a nice bump or a nice little cherry on his stock as people start to consider how much they can leverage him as a runner in the NFL. Yeah, but he's like he's not a runner though. Thing he's straight line. But he's not elusive particularly. Kind of like how Chris Olave is like fast and athletic, but Chris Olave is not a runner after the catch. Chris Olave, with the ball in his hands, is never not really a creator. That's kind of how I feel about Desmond Ritter, and that yeah, he's athletic, but he's not a creator. To me, the weigh in is going to be the biggest thing Desmond Ritter does in Indy. And yeah, he came in already and weighed at the Senior Bowl at two hundred seven pounds, but can he weigh in? Can he put on? Uh, obviously, you're not putting on much muscle from then to now in a month and a half. You, could maybe put on a pound if that of muscle but like can he still move at a bigger weight uh it's probably going to be the important thing to look out for before we jump to running back receiver etc guy who might struggle at the combine or maybe see some stock fall and then other other quarterbacks there that could help themselves and, and this goes back to expectations like i said uh, struggling versus what you kind of expect or want them to be and, and so obviously like jack Cohn from notre dame is not 
he's not going to go blow up the combine. Everyone and their mother knows that Jack Cohn's going to test like ass. Test like you or me going to the Oh, to the let's combine. go. Uh, <laughs> but to me, Sam Howell is being coveted or the North Carolina quarterback for or was in college a runner. He ran for over a thousand yards. And you, you know, when you hear a quarterback run for over a thousand yards, kind of envision something in your head that I'm not sure Sam Howell's going to necessarily be. He's just kind of a tough runner. He's almost like a fullback as opposed to an actual running back in the way he runs. And now he might put up a nice cone. He might test like Tim Tebow did, where it was like a really nice – Tim Tebow had a six 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 three cone. The devil's combine, three cone. But then like a four six something. I, I think Howell could even be more like a four eight as a pure speed guy in the 40, which that's not a rushing threat then in your offense really. The other guy that I only had to want to call out, and I kind of mentioned him already, is that like Carson Strong, right? If Carson Strong, these medicals come up and, and – and, and aren't what people want them to be or need them to be we have talked about this before on previous podcasts previous episodes is that there are teams where if you show up with a certain injury you're not just dropping down their board you're off their board like there are legitimately injuries that teams do not draft based on the evaluations that they have from their team doctor so you'll you'll be like how's this guy falling how is this team gonna let him fall past him it's like dude he might be off their board you know this guy might be all all yeah. off their board to a point because of an injury or because of a red flag in the in the in the interview process, the character, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Let's get to running back. You you're running back with the most to gain at the combine. This one's tough. I, I think it's Kenneth Walker, though. Because one, I think he's a good athlete. Like I think he's a plus athlete, pretty all around. But if he tests really well, say he runs in the four fours, say his, you know, his broads and whatever invert are, are in elite range. I think you could start to talk about him at, I don't want to say back end in the first, but top of the second. Wow. Like he, he could get easily top 50 lock status if he goes to the combine and shows out. So I, I don't think anyone else is in that conversation of, A, if they test really well, they can be in that early second round conversation or even the second round conversation at all. But I think Kenneth Walker is one that is. You're not going to say your guy? Damian Pierce? 21st ranked player on the draft on, on the Bruce Feldman's freaks list, the guy that's clocked a four five flat with six percent body fat and squatted seven hundred and five pounds. That's currently outside the top two hundred on multiple people's draft boards. I thought you would have Damian Pierce here. I don't think he, I, I'm not sure he's got a ton to gain. I don't know. Maybe, they're splitting hairs here. I, I do think he has a, a lot to gain, but I just think Kenneth Walker, like value wise, can really push yeah. the stock up. Whereas Damian Pierce, I think, is capped as like a maybe he sneaks into the third round kind of guy, even if he tests well. I think he has a lot to gain with media. <laughs> he has a lot to gain yeah. with other people getting on his tape, but maybe not with the NFL. Who is going to be your top performer? You, who are you predicting to be the top performer at the running back position in, in Indy? This one's tough. I, I think Pierce will be up there, but I'm not sure he – I don't think he'll run a 4-5. I just don't see 4-5 on tape. I, I'd be surprised if he does. The guy – I think James Cook will test really well, the Georgia running back, but like – Will he weigh anywhere close to what a running back should is the thing. The guy who I'll highlight that I think will test well is Zonovan Knight, Bam Knight from North North NC State. Uh, split carries, split time over there, at, over his time at NC State, but I think he's going to test really well, all-around sort of athlete. Reminds me a lot of Elijah Mitchell last year, who wasn't the most impressive runner, I'll say, like a little loose with his running style. But it's just a really high end athlete for the position. So I think I could see that being Zonovan Knight for sure. Zonovan Knight was one of my, my favorite interviews at the Super Bowl. I, I sat down with him at the Super Bowl. And after we left the interview, I was hanging out with him and, and talking to his agent. And uh, he sees Max Crosby walk by, who is at the Super Bowl. And he's like, damn. He, said, he kind of looks at me. He's like, who does he play for? I was like, the Raiders. And he's like, damn, these motherfuckers are big in the NFL. <laughs> like, <laughs> it, was, it, was, uh, it was funny to see him kind of like have that real. I mean, I'm not saying like. No, it's not, the NFL is too big for Zonovan Knight, but I think it was funny to see him have that realization. Like, Max Crosby is a huge dude that has added a ton of weight since getting to the NFL. And I was yeah. like, dude, that's what they're going to do, right? Like, if a team wants to add 40 pounds to you in the NFL, they're going to find a way to do it. Like, they will literally find a way to do it. It's like college on steroids, right? Um, not No pun not, not Not actually. Literally sometimes. Sometimes, maybe. Sometimes. Um, others who could help themselves or and, and the guy who might struggle at the combine at the running back position. I think the guy who might struggle to me is Isaiah Spiller, Texas A&M running back. I just don't see that top end speed. I guess see like four sixes. Uh, I just, I think he's a nice running back, but I just think he's a middling athlete all around. And he's getting, you know, he's top 50 on DJ's draft board. And I'm not, obviously guys who might struggle again, I'm not going to go trash someone like Kennedy Brooks from Oklahoma, who I was already like 
you know, not getting hyped up as a top running back. I'm talking about like guys who are legit backs that I just don't think might meet expectations of the combine. So I'd say Spiller's the guy I'd highlight. Others, did you highlight others that um, I know you wanted to bring up Jerome Ford? I thought another guy that maybe, maybe Rashad White, the Arizona State running back, like maybe he could impress at the combine. I know he's another freaks list member as well. Like those are two backs. I think it's that- Quandre White is the guy, I, the other one who could help himself that is interesting. He went to the senior bowl, the South Carolina running back went to the senior bowl. I, I think he could put up some, some interesting testing numbers because he has, he has some cutting ability and some explosiveness out of his cuts that's like, rare on tape but he is like a pure project for a running back which you know that's rare to even say Rashad White too man remember we were watching some of those routes at the senior bowl oh, it's like tough. this guy this guy might even make some moves here wide receiver the the next position we want to go for most to gain at the receiver position for you I think it's Garrett Wilson from Ohio State I, I think he could put himself especially if he keeps falling down the, boards <laughs> yeah, he could put himself in the top 15 sort of vicinity should he, one, show up well-built. Like, should he show up not six foot 185 like we think he could. Like, just on tape, he doesn't look that big. And went from being listed at 6'2 at Ohio State back a couple years ago to now six foot. Um, that's worrisome. Like, if, if he shows up in the 190s, tests sub four five forty, and, like, puts together a 40 inch for you know 11 foot broad all of a sudden we're talking about okay yeah Garrett Wilson's that dude athletically he can be everything you want at the position but if he shows up like I think most to gain maybe a misnomer he just has the highest variability in his outcome should his with his performance at the combine what about uh, a name I was going to bring up in the most to gain potentially I know he's already like considered this like consensus you know not a consensus wide receiver one but a lot of you people view him as wide receiver one but i think to answer some questions about the injury and answer some questions potentially about speed drake london drake london of usc who has been is he going to test that's the thing i don't know if he is going to test but the medical checks will be a key piece of it if he does test i do think he has a lot to gain i'm not really i'm not sure i doubt he does fair i just said doubt he does no he probably hasn't had the opportunity to rehab and then also prepare I, i agree he probably does not have the opportunity to test how about your top performer your predicted top performer I'm going to go, there's a couple of guys. Like, so Alec Pierce from Cincinnati is on Bruce Feldman's freaks list. You know, he's going to test well. But I'm going to go Calvin Austin, the Memphis wide receiver, former walk-on, who I bet he runs in the 4-3 side. He is just a ball of explosiveness. And now he's like five foot seven and is he's tiny. about as, yeah, about as small as you'll see. Rondale Moore-esque, but also Rondale Moore-esque athleticism. So, yeah, Calvin Austin. Despite the size, I think still blows up the combine. Five foot seven, 173 pounds. Uh, mm. I think relative to his weight, he won't be a top performer, right? I think that that'll be like people will be looking obviously for bigger receivers to, to get into that mold, but um, we'll see. Guy who might struggle before you, you have David Bell, the Purdue wide receiver, highlighted here. Can I? I want to highlight Traylon Burks. Traylon Burks, who's a Bruce, Bruce Feldman's freak number, he's one of the strongest receivers in all of college football. There's numbers that they throw out with his squat and his bench that are absurd. It's a guy that we've said multiple times has worked down from 230 to 225. He's a true 6'3", 225. He's got almost 11 inch hands. Like the bigness and the explosive uh, and the bigness and the strength will stand out. He's not going to run as fast as DK Metcalf, which is the comp that you've thrown around. And like these agilities, man. Like will these short shuttles and three cones not be concerning i'd be surprised if we came out of the combine and burks's you know short shuttle and three cone were not reminiscent of a of a jalen rager or um or dk metcalf i'd be surprised if he even measure or does them fair I'd be no totally fall, fair you know? that's that i i would almost i think that's minus money right now if the DraftKings had a sport had a bet out on whether or not Traylon burks will do the short shoulder or the three cone i think it would be about minus 200 because it just doesn't make sense with how many people see him as a top 10 player in this class potentially the wide receiver one what's the point yeah right what's the point especially especially after you know the dk metcalf comp that was literally the talk of everything dk falls to the back in the second round yeah so. true very true i think yeah. his agent i mean there i'll tell you right now Here's the process. If you're testing any of those things right now and preparing for the combine right now and your numbers aren't good, your agent's going to be very quick to say, we'll wait for the pro day. It's just it's yeah. just that simple. And it's just it's a money decision. Yeah. It's a it's a and literal then you pull business. A hammy before the pro day. Same. And that's it. And then it's perfect. Um yeah. 
that was a guy that I highlighted, a guy who might struggle. If he doesn't test, I guess there's no struggle yeah. to be had. But w w expand more on David Bell. But yeah, David Bell is just kind of a middling athlete. That's why he's not considered amongst top wide receivers. So 85th and PFF board, the Purdue wide out. That's probably why he, like I said, that's why he's where he is on the bat draft board. But if he tests well, obviously he's a guy that like you'll reevaluate and be like, oh shit, he ran a 4 4. Now I don't think he will. But like if he did, you got to have to go back and reevaluate because they could legitimately move them up boards. Uh, the guys who I also want to highlight that could improve their stocks that I think have something to gain here. George Pickens, not sure he will test, obviously coming off the ACL, even though he did play a few games this past year. May not think he's fully healthy, but George Pickens, I think, could give, make himself a lot of money. Justin Ross from Clemson as well. Those two will highlight as guys who a lot riding on this testing with, you know, the lack of production on tape the last couple of years. I'd add Jalen Tolbert to that list. I think Jalen Tolbert can go to the combine and show out a bit. I think he'd be more respected on, on at least media draft boards. I think PFF is one of the highest you know, outlets right now on Jalen Tolbert, a guy that I thought looked really good at the Senior Bowl. Uh, I, I think he's another guy that if he tests well, um, could could go up boards as well. Let's go to tight end. And before we do, shouting out Western Southern, a sponsor. The Tailgate Podcast is sponsored by Western Southern uh, Financial Group. While you focus on your roster moves, guess what? Western Southern is helping you advance your money moves. Buying your first home, planning to start a family, wondering how to make your money grow. Western Southern's playbook of life insurance, investment, and retirement solutions helps you rest assured on game day. Team up to understand needs and address goals with a game plan built just for you. Get started at westernsouthern.com slash PFS. Stay tuned for the Draft DraftKings read. It is coming later, and it will be 360 windmill good. I'll tell you that right now. Tight end, most to gain. Who is it? I think it's Isaiah Likely, the Coastal Carolina tight end. We've talked a lot about him just as a pure receiver. I mean, he's he might be as good as he gets in this class. He might be better than Trey McBride, honestly. Uh, but he's a lot smaller than Trey McBride. 241 pounds to get to that at the Senior Bowl was probably a chore for him. So can he, like, what does he test athletically at 241 pounds? That remains to be seen. If if he goes there, 241, runs in the four fives, like, shit, we can talk about him as a real top you know, 75 kind of guy in this class. But... Uh, to me, I I'm guessing he's not going to be in that range after putting on that kind of weight. I saw some highlighting, you know, this is an opportunity for a lot of tight ends to make some movement in the draft because I think this middle, this tight end class, well, they're all the same. Yeah, they're all, yeah, like they, there's going to be, there's going to be some movement on a lot of people's boards, I think, from the tight end group because right now a lot of them are just like kind of all hodgepodge in this like late second round to top of the fourth round with a bunch of tight ends going to come off the board. I'm interested to see how that goes. Top performer, your prediction. My prediction is UAB's Garrett Prince. Who? He was a Shrine Bowl invite. He averaged 20.3 yards per catch as a tight end for UAB this past year. Um, late bloomer had all of 100 and 29 yards prior to this his entire prior to 2021 his entire career but 651 yards this past year the guy can fly in a straight line now not a route runner by any means at the shrine bowl very raw but again talk about athleticism still wins the tight end position so he could make himself some money and be a top performer there guys who might a guy who might struggle and then others you feel could help themselves i think Jalen weidemeyer is gonna struggle the Texas a and m tight end a lot of a lot of early buzz from him as a tight end one and is one of the few true juniors. He might be the only true junior coming out in this tight end class now that I think about it. Um, you know, hyped up this past year, but I think he's going to run the four eights. I don't think he's fast. Like on tape, he has some wiggle to him for a bigger dude, but he just, when he has to open it up the throttle, I don't think he has a ton in the tank. So Weidermeyer is the guy that I'd be concerned about testing at the combine who again we're talking about top guys top options and like what they'd expect them to do Weidermeyer's the one I'd highlight how about the guys who could help themselves this one's like you said everyone in that range <laughs> of like middling tight ends there's probably like 20 probably like 12 tight ends from 100 to 200 on the PFF's draft board just a ton thrown in there that all like have size can kind of catch have hands but the ones I'll highlight that I think could test well, Greg Dolchich, the UCLA tight end, who's a former wide receiver, and then Derek Deese Jr. from San Jose State, who's a Shrine Bowl guy who's he himself is 
undersized in the 230s, but I think he could be athletic as well. Uh, so those are the two guys I'll say could help himself. Before we jump to offensive tackle and interior offensive line, close out the show with those positions, I just saw this got sent to me by like three different people. Scooby Wright has been drafted by the Birmingham Stallions in the USFL. Mm, I'm sure we go. I am a lifelong Birmingham Stallions fan now, knowing that Scooby Wright is on that team. He was the fourth pick in the 21st round of the USFL, a guy that I it was Arizona or Arizona State where he was awesome. Arizona. Arizona, man. That guy's tape coming out of Arizona was hashtag fun to watch. The Birmingham Stallions, my new favorite team in the USFL. Offensive tackle, most to gain. I could, I, you have one name listed here, and I agree with you, especially considering the, the podcast we just did where we talked about how you're the highest on him and that Central Michigan offensive tackle, Bernard Ryman. There are a lot of offensive tackles that I think could you know, boost their stock with, with an impressive combine. I think the other one I'd highlight, at, and I'll let you go to Bernard Ryman after this, is Trevor Penning. Trevor Penning going to number six in Daniel Jeremiah's mm -hmm. mock draft, I'll tell you what, means that there is some athleticism to this dude. And he was the 69th ranked player on um, Bruce Wellman's freaks list, a guy that apparently can squat 625, cleans 385, can run in the four eights at his size. Or no, no, low five, low, low five zero at his size. I, I think that, yeah, that will... That will that will ring true considering what Daniel Jeremiah is seemingly hearing about Trevor Penning right now with that mock draft coming out yesterday. Everyone's like Trevor Penning over Charles Cross, Trevor Penning in the top 10. Are you high? I do think that there's a good chance that he could vault up boards if he does test as well as, you know, this suggests and as well as that mock draft suggests. Yeah. This is why I keep saying, or have said a lot, like there's five tackles in this class. You want one of those five. Cause I think, all these guys are going to test really well. Cross, Aquanu, Neil, Ryman, Penning. Like, honestly, when it's all said and done, Cross may have the worst testing. Of yeah, no, I agree. In terms of just, like, across the board, sort of athleticism, whatever. But I think they're all fairly high-end athletes in some way, shape, or form. Now, I think Ryman's is going to be sort of the 40, the three-cone, the shuttle. He's going to crush those, in my opinion, just from having watched him on tape. Whereas Penning's is probably going to be the bench press. And maybe like the broad jump, like he is just an explosively built human being. Evan Neal, obviously, across the board, a Quanu bench, any explosive drill. But then Charles Cross thing is just like a pretty quality all around athlete. But I don't think he's the kind of special that we see with the other guys. But again, you don't need to be at the tackle position. You just need to be probably a little bit above average athlete, which Cross more than that is. So most again, Ryman, top performer. Still going to go Evan Neal. I think he's going to be Dude. some freakish numbers for his size. <laughs> Evan Neal's combine is going to be talked about for months, bro. This is going to be a special combine for Evan Neal, the number one player on Bruce Feldman's freaks list. I wanted to highlight, I know you have Daniel Falele here, the Minnesota offensive tackle, as a guy who will struggle or might struggle. I think Cross isn't going to struggle, but in terms of guys that where viewpoints could drop the most, I think Charles Cross could be in there because you are going to see these other guys, right? You are going to see these other offensive tackles test like freaks, whereas Cross maybe isn't a legitimate freak, but is more of a, you know just a great or good or great athlete. While Evan Neal, Aquanu, um, you know maybe Penning are, are testing like at rates relative to their weight that are just absurd. I I disagree that uh, it, to me it's, it's going to be like or that conversation is kind of like twenty nine. 2020 excuse me where thomas was by far the worst thomas was the worst athlete of that top group in terms of just you know production or in terms of like pure combine stats but he was still a very good athlete and obviously didn't drop so on fourth overall he went number one tackle one in that class so i don't think that cross like he's still going to test very well for a tackle and yeah. no one's going to be like oh drop cross bump the other guys ahead of him after this fair enough how about other guys that could – or no, talk more yeah, about so, Fale. So might struggle. I, I think Fale, though, he – I just think you're going to get some tough – whether it's the shuttle, whether it's the cone, that that's just not him. Man. He's just not that natural of a mover. There's just no and way. Especially, <laughs> like, one, not a natural mover, and then, like, you add on the fact that he's 390 and just gets exacerbated. So that, to me, Daniel Fale, size – hands whatever all the measurables we've already seen at the senior bowl everything else the sort of on-field actual testing i think could not be doing him any favors what do you think what's the over under if you had to put one out on falale's 40 yard dash i need to know is it six 
I, no, I, no, no it, way. It's five, like five, five and a half. Five, five, something really? Like five, four, five, four, five and a half. Yeah, something in that range. I'm going to look like, up, like, what is, like, a 400 pounders, like, what, a 400 or 380 plus pound offensive lineman? What have they run? What have they run in, in, at the combine in previous years? Like, I don't know. I don't really have a good game. How many have there been? How many How have there been? been yeah. No, I'm, 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 I'm interested to see uh, other guys that could help their stock. Uh, I'll highlight Kellen Deesh, the Arizona State offense tackle. I think he's going to test really well. And again, the movement drills, the three cone, shuttle, uh, 40. And then I think Nicholas petit Friere, if he tests out well above average in a number of ways, and I think he's a good athlete for the position, but would like to see that confirmed via testing because he's a project. Like if the guy's a project, he better actually have the athletic tools that you think he has. And so – that's a guy, the Ohio State left tackle that I had highlighted as well. I looked up quickly, worst combines ever. Isaiah Thompson, who was a 300-pound offensive guard, ran a six ran a 40 yard dash. That's that's crazy. I don't think it'll be that bad. And that guy wasn't even. Who was the? Pounds. There was the U, USC, oh, the USC guy. He had a great mama, Damian Mama. Came in like 380, right? It was mm -hmm. a guard. What did he run? Let's see. Damien yeah. Mama, 40 yard dash. 584. That's Wait. what it's going to be, dude. It's going to be, in, yeah, dude. That, and he, was, he, was only, he was only what? 334. He was only 340 pounds. He was right? only 334? Yeah. What? I mean, that's what it's going to be, though. Was like there's just no fucking way. On. There's no yeah. way Faale is running like a 47. I can't. There's no way. He's too big. Yeah, He's I too mean, big. Okay, duh, not a four seven, but oh no, a five seven. I think five five, five five, five six is probably where you put it. I'm putting the line at five seven. I, I mean, if he that that'd be just absurd. That'd just be absurd. All right, interior offensive line. Let's close this out. Um, yeah, interior offensive line. There's not much though. Like interior is another one where you don't really probably the least meaningful after quarterback in terms of just like athletic testing versus actual on field performance. Most to gain at that point. I'm not really sh sure. Like there's there's not one that really sticks out for again the reasons just outlined, but I think Dylan Parham, the Memphis offensive guard slash center possibly, is one that I'd highlight as if he tests really well athletically and he's a guy who's always undersized and it's because of this because he looks like he's like 290 on tape was listed at 290 came to Senior Bowl at 305. If he's still athletic at 305, you're buying it. You're buying that he put on good weight and that it's whatever. If he's not athletic at 305 that might be bad weight. And that might be a guy who just can't get up to the poundage. So I think he has the most to gain by proving that top performer. I think it's going to be Tyler Lindebaum, the Iowa center. If you've watched him, you know why <laughs> I mean like that dude can scoot. So I, I fully expect sub five second 40. You, you never know at that point where, but I think you could end up in the four eights pretty easily with how well he moves. The guy who might struggle that I'm a little worried about that's high in the PFF board would be Marquise Hayes, the Oklahoma guard. Uh, he's just not super fleet of foot, even though he's very good in pass protection. I, I think it's some of the best independent hand usage in his class and I, I think can do things in that regard that are what you want at the position at the NFL level, but he's just not fleet of foot, man. So that that's a guy who could come out of it being like, eh, maybe that's – Maybe that's not necessarily what we want at guard. Maybe it's even below the threshold of athleticism. Jason Poe is one we have to highlight here. Our guy from Mercer, the best pulling guard Mercer in guard. college football. Yes. Built like a fucking mini fridge. I'm excited. More people, just, I, I just hope we get some B roll of his tape. Can we just get some B-roll of his tape at the combine? Because we people need to see this kid. People need to see Jason Poe's tape. Not enough people have. He plays for Mercer. Turn on the Bama tape. Turn on the Bama tape with Jason Poe. It is electric. Literally electric. Uh, I don't know how much he helps himself, right? Pretty scheme dependent, but uh, he is he's going to be sick. I mean, he's going to be sick at the combine, probably really explosive. We were I don't know who I was talking to that's working out with him. I was someone at the East West Shrine Bowl, I believe, who's working out with him. Uh, where, you know, this, oh, yeah. And it he, was uh, Myron Tagovailoa Mosa. Yeah, yeah. Myron Tagovailoa Mimosa? Not Mimosa. Mimosa. <laughs> Amosa, he said that yeah. there's. He, I was like, who is some of the guys that you're talking to at this training facility that he's at? And he's like, oh, there's this one dude. He's like, his name's Poe or something. And I'm like, oh, Jason Poe. He's like, he's like coming out of his stance or like beating them in the 40 yard dash at like like with 50 extra pounds. He's gonna he's gonna surprise some people for sure. Oh yeah, oh yeah, Poe yeah. That's gonna and you had Kenyon Green also on here as well. 
Yeah, Kenyon Green is a guy who, again, most to gain, interior offensive line, whatever. But I just think he's going to be an all-around good athlete. And I think he's going to put up good numbers in the bench and whatever. He just looks like that on tape. And so I think he could help himself by really or kind of solidify his, you know, 11th overall pick status, according to Daniel and Jeremiah, by putting together a nice combine. That's going to do it for this episode of Tailgate. Make sure you rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast tomorrow remote. Renner will still be in Florida enjoying PTO, but he's putting out podcasts for you guys. We will do the speak pipe edition. We got four new voicemails that we've chose chosen from the hundreds of voicemails you guys are sending in. Really appreciate everyone who goes to speakpipe.com slash tailgate for those voicemails. And then we're also going to answer some mailbag questions. Make sure you rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast. If you leave a review on Apple Podcasts, leave a question in there. We will get to it on the mailbag episodes. Until next time, Austin Gale, Mike Renner, Tailgate. <laughs>